Hi, I'm Judy Morano, and thank you for joining us today. I'm here today with Gail Carson Levine, award winning author of Ella Enchanted and many, many other books. But we're here particularly to talk today about The Lost Kingdom of Bamar, which is your new book. Um, is this a continuation of The Two Princesses book? The Two Princesses of Bamar was the book that I wrote quite a long time ago. Mm -hmm. But it starts at, with a fragment of an epic poem okay. that's about a ruined ragtag band leaving a destroyed place. Okay. And the people in Two Princesses don't know whether the epic poem fragment has to do with history or whether it has to do with myth. And so I didn't know either because I didn't write that. So I've always been curious. Mm -hmm. And this book, Lo The Lost Kingdom of Bamar, is a prequel. And I wrote it in part, at least, to discover whether it's myth or history and to provide the history. So readers who are familiar with uh, the original mm -hmm. will um, be surprised at some of the, and some of the characters. Okay. Now, the characters in the book, do you create a character first? Do you create a story first? How does that work for you? I am a plot-challenged author who is most interested in plot. Okay. So, um, but I need help. And I turn to fairy tales for help a lot. Okay. Because fairy tales are generally simple. Mm -hmm. But they give me a structure that I can hang a story on, I can embroider around, mm -hmm. and, um, and also I know a lot of fairy tales. So in this case, the one that came to me as being the right story for this mm -hmm. was Rapunzel. Okay. So, but the fairy tale of Rapunzel, in my opinion, peters out at the end. Okay. So, and because I'm ch plot challenged, uh -huh. I needed more help. And I found the help in the unlikely place, and it's the Exodus part of the story of Moses. Oh, so uh, my elevator pitch for this book is that it's Rapunzel meets Moses. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So mm -hmm. I don't start with characters. Mm -hmm. I tend, I start with plot, and I generally get confused. and. Um, I find my characters in what the plot seems to call for. Okay, and how long does a book like this take for you to write? It depends on how confused and lost I got. <laughs> I didn't get that lost on this one, so uh -huh. this was about a year. Okay. I would say average is about two. Um, my mystery, Stolen Magic, I got more lost than I ever have before, and it took four and a half years. Wow. And yeah, I was unhappy for a lot of that time <laughs> until I finally figured it out. And do you sit down every day? Is it like a regimented, like I sit down and write and then I do this? Or does it, it just kind of when it comes to you, you sit down and write? Or It's not when it comes, but it also isn't specific times. Mm -hmm. So um, I keep track of the time. And okay. my goal is at least two and a quarter hours a day. Okay. And I try to do better than that. But for example, right now I'm figuring out what I'm writing next. I'm doing a lot of reading. It's much looser. Mm -hmm. But I'm also like incapable of ignoring the telephone or the email. So that's why I it's just... It's hard to disconnect. Yes. Yeah. So that's why I keep track of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you work from home. I do. But I work anywhere. So um, on Sunday I'm going, I'm going on a book tour for this. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I can write in airports, I can write on planes, on trains, in cars if I'm not driving. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> okay, so you come up with your story, you have your influences. Do you model your characters after people? Do you just wait for the story to develop them? Like, will I see somebody that you know in a story, like traits from somebody that maybe you know? Well, you might see that, but it might not be in my mind that I'm doing that. Okay. Because a lot of writing is subconscious. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I do. For example, in Ella Enchanted, um, the horrible stepsister Hattie mm -hmm. is based on my Aunt Harriet. Okay. Does she know that? 
Uh, well, she's safely dead. Okay. And she was safely dead when I wrote it. Okay. But one of the charms of writing mm -hmm. is that you can get revenge. <laughs> and when I talk to kids about that, I say that we don't want to hurt feelings. Mm -hmm. So we want to disguise the character. As best you can. Yeah, yeah, so that the person reading it isn't going to recognize him or herself. But, um, but you'll know. And that, that's very pleasurable. Uh-huh. That's great. That's great. Um, well, one of the, uh, publish one of the um, readers of your book, Publishers Weekly, actually said, um, the fans of Gail Carson Levine will rejoice to watch the journey of another strong, flawed heroine in this book. So I was so interested in that. Um, strong, flawed, is that kind of a, a thing that we see repeated in your stories? Well, they all have obstacles. Mm -hmm. um, in Fairest, it's not so much a flaw as s at birth, she's um, not pretty. So that's one of the Her things obstacle. she has to deal with. In mm -hmm. Ella, it's the curse of obedience. Mm -hmm. um, my job as a writer, it's one of the things I say in my book for kids about writing, um, is to make my characters suffer. One way or another, they have to suffer. Well, that's reality. I think that's closer to life than fantasy. Yeah, and, um, but it's also hard to get involved in a book with a character for whom everything is going well. Right. So, um, so in this book, I wanted to um, give Perry as my main character, which stands for Peregrine because she's always peregrinating. She's never still. Mm -hmm. um, and she is abducted soon after birth. Mm -hmm. uh, she's born into a lower class Bamar family and abducted. And this is the Rapunzel part. Her f father steals food from the noblewoman's garden mm -hmm. and is caught. And the punishment that's exacted is that this childless noblewoman takes Perry to raise as her child okay. and takes Perry's older sister to raise, to keep as Perry's servant which sets the two off for a rocky relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, the noblewoman is Lacti, and they are the overlords and the oppressors. And they're a martial culture. They're not given to a lot of emotion. Mm -hmm. So Perry is raised by a mother who's cold and by a father who's rarely, rarely there, because in this martial culture, he's out warring all the time. Mm -hmm. And what that brings about in her is an awkwardness. Mm -hmm. She is emotionally awkward. She has a lot of trouble um, showing that she likes people, being natural with people, mm -hmm. because she's the um, daughter, the adopted daughter, but the daughter of the uh, primary people in the castle. She's kept it a remove from the other children. Much like Rapunzel was in the tower. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. although there is an actual tower coming up, too. <laughs> okay. Um, but that's a great analogy. I hadn't thought of that. That's great. Uh, anyway, so that's her personality challenge, mm -hmm. which she doesn't overcome, which she learns to... And so many young women have that challenge. Uh -huh. I, feel, I feel like a lot of young women can relate to that, you know, just not feeling like you're fitting in exactly right. around what's happening around right. you. That's very common right. at that age, the, you know, the age, your, your demographic that you're, you're writing towards. Yeah, so she's got a lot of hard edges and corners mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. if she were softer, she'd do better. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And the s parent, parental figure, is that something you could relate to? Is that... Did you draw on your own previous history, your parents, people you know as the, the, a colder mother and a distant father, or is that just all fantasy? Well, it is true that my father worked a lot when okay. I was a kid. Uh, my mother was not like that. My mother was um, more emotionally available than this mother. So it was my idea of what a mother in a very... Um, the Spartan 
kind of household okay. mm -hmm. might be like. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Um, so you, you were mentioning your book about how teaching children how to write. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the workshops you've done. I've known for years. I've been in Brewster for 10 years. And you've been in Brewster? Since 93. Okay. So right around when I moved here, too. Mm -hmm. um, I know you've always done these workshops for kids at the museum every summer. And they're well attended, I know. And people look forward to them and talk about them after years after they attend. So what, what is the purpose of the workshop? What do you hope kids get out of it? How did you start that? Just tell me a little bit about that. When Ella got published, mm -hmm. and this continues, I felt and feel like one of the luckiest people on the planet. And it seemed to me that I needed to give back. Mm -hmm. And what I started by doing was going to the middle school every week. Okay. And I was teaching a few, not many, it, it was a very well kept secret, um, kids there. Mm -hmm. And years passed and um, I became busier and it became tough to do it every week. Mm -hmm. But once I started doing it, one of the benefits for me was that I knew there was a book in it. So um, that's what led to writing magic. Mm -hmm. But there are many benefits for me. It's good for me to be around kids. Um, I don't try my stories out on kids. But it's a reminder that kids are people. And, right. So um, you certainly pick up some of their nuances and some of their affects a little bit just from being around them. Yeah. yeah. And they're not mysteries. And I don't have kids. So this is a good thing for me to do. Mm -hmm. um, and also, when I teach, and also I blog about writing. So when I blog and when I teach, I revisit the issues in writing that I have to always be aware of. Uh -huh. So it's... Well, the it best way to learn is to teach. Yes, That's yes, exactly. That is very true, yeah. So it keeps my writing sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has all kinds of benefits for me. and. Um, it pleases me to find out what's happening with kids. Some come back year after year. Uh -huh. So um, so I just love to do it. And, and what I is the outcome? Is it, what, is it a week long? It's, I do it for an hour and a half um, on Wednesday afternoons mm -hmm. from 1.30 to 3 mm -hmm. at the museum. In the summer? In the summer uh -huh. uh, on Wednesdays. OK. And, um, did I say it's six weeks? It's six no, you weeks. didn't. Six, six weeks. weeks. And is there a charge for this? No, it's free. Wonderful. We love free Thanks. programming for children in the area. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. OK. And the kids come out with a story when they're done? Not necessarily, okay. no. In fact, I tell them uh, when we start out that the goal is not to finish something. The goal okay. is to explore different parts of writing. And the first week, I ask them what they're interested in learning, if any of them are watching this, I want to know what you'd like to, n to learn. Uh -huh. um, and I take my cue from them. Okay. But I, there are things I also do. I also do poetry. Mm -hmm. And every week I do a vocabulary word. And I make a game of it. So I And they don't even realize they're learning during the summer with you. It's kind of like learning through fun, learning through this great experience. Well, they are. I mean, for sure, the vocabulary is fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, the writing, uh, I think they're aware of learning. Mm -hmm. I, I think the vo what I do with the vocabulary is I pick a word that I think is fun. Uh -huh. Like if I haven't had them before, I often do steatopygia, which means a shelf like a shelf like rear end. <laughs> <laughs> but I write steatopygia on the board. I have them tell me what part of speech it is, mm -hmm. and. This is on a little piece of paper. They write the part of speech, mm -hmm. and without knowing what the definition is, I have them make up a definition. How fun. And then I slip in the real one. Uh -huh. And they vote on <laughs> which one it is. And I put the real one in a child vernacular, mm -hmm. and they hardly ever get it. And they probably wind up, I tell them what the real one is, but probably the wrong one sticks. <laughs> and then, or and or then. 10 years down the road, that word's going to come up, and they're going to go, you know, I learned that at this workshop. <laughs> That's right, right. It's a great Jeopardy moment where you kind of recall yeah. that information. Yeah, so we have fun with it. But also the purpose is because to get them interested, they are. They're, the kids who come are generally writers to the core. 
Okay. And we're all interested in language, and yeah. I'm reinforcing that. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, you mentioned poetry with the kids, and I know that you recently wrote a poetry book called Transient. Yes. Um, I was at a reading of that book, and I it got wonderful reviews, and people seemed very excited about it. What made you decide to move into a an adult poetry book? I mean, you know, move away from the children's books for a minute. I write for kids because my f most important reading experience of fiction was as a kid. Mm -hmm. And when I write for kids, I return to that reader, whom I know very well. Mm -hmm. My most important experience reading poetry was as an adult. And so when I write poetry, it's to my adult self. It's an adult self, right, right. You can kind of, it's a different place in your head and yes. it's a different reaction, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, um, we are going to, luckily, have you doing a reading and talking about your new book at the studio around the corner on May 28th at 2 o'clock. And it is also a free event for the community. And we actually are having a mother-daughter tea that day. So we'll be serving tea and cookies. And a lot of little girls in princess dresses are, so be prepared, because they're oh, all dressing for cool. tea. So <laughs> it should be very fun. Um, but I was wondering if you'd share maybe a little reading with us today, um, sort of as a precursor to what's going to happen at the studio, if you'd sure. like. Okay, sure. Terrific. So one minute, and we'll have Gail read a little bit of the, her book for us. Before I start to read, I need to tell you a few things. Throughout the book, there are themes uh, about oppression and prejudice and stereotyping. Perry's adopted father, Lord Tobe, is very prejudiced against the Bamar and does not know that his adopted daughter was born Bamar. The only one who knows, the only ones who know are her sister, uh, Lady Tove's maid, and Lady Tove herself. And, unbeknownst to any of them, all the Castle Bamar servants who keep it a secret. Perry is a fabulous runner, and in this scene she has just completed a race. Her father is home from the wars, so, um, and we see his prejudice operating here. Father was home over the summer when I was ten during an unusual outbreak of peace. On an August day, he and Lady Mother watched me race and, of course, win. Afterward, the three of us stood by the bleachers at the edge of the arena with Annette hovering a yard away. Annette is Perry's sister. I was wet with sweat, and a Bamar manservant bustled to us bearing a towel. This servant uh, was one of Mistress Clara's helpers. He brought our weapons and set up obstacles when we rode across the field. He was in middle age and portly. I didn't know his name and neither liked nor disliked him. He must have acted without thinking. Rather than hold the towel out, he draped it around my bare shoulders, bare because girls raced in sleeveless shifts boys in sleeveless tunics. Father slapped him. Annette yelped. I gasped. The servant fell back onto the first and second rows of benches. Father's lips disappeared into a thin, flat line, and his eyes glittered. The breath felt trapped in my chest. Lady Mother said, Tove, not now, darling. He pulled the man up. Did you believe I wouldn't object to your Bamar hands on my daughter's skin? So that shows you what's going on between the Bamar and the Lacti. Thank you, Gail. That was wonderful. That's um, fun. Yeah, I can't wait to read it. I haven't read it yet, but I know that I will be. Maybe it'll be a beach read. <laughs> so you're working on a new book, possibly. You want to give us some clues what we can expect coming next? Well, what will be next is actually a prequel to Ella Enchanted. Oh, how exciting. Yes, and I'm waiting for edits from my editor on it. Uh -huh. uh, and it's a reverse gender Beauty and the Beast. It's called Ogre Enchanted. 
Oh, how cool. And in the first few pages, my main character gets turned into an ogre and um, has to struggle with this vast appetite. And she wants to eat everyone. Oh, okay. So, uh, so <laughs> as a prequel, does that mean this character is actually in Ella Enchanted? Will we see any she characters? She is not, but she there are not. others that are. Okay. And is it written now? Is it done? It's written. Oh. I'm waiting for edits. So that will be next. Okay. And I'm researching, I'm thinking about doing a historical novel based on my ancestry. My father was a, um, a, a Jew who was born in Turkey where his family had migrated. Okay. Starting in 1492 when the Jews were kicked out of Spain. So I'm thinking of setting it back there. Would it also be um, at the level for children, or are you looking it at an adult I'm, book? I'm, what I'm thinking about now is how I can make this Accessi a kid's book. Accessible to yes, kids. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and it's deeply troubling what happened. Mm -hmm. So I'm figuring out how I can approach it in a way that won't be devastating. I love that you take these really, these issues of prejudice and, and racism and fitting in and and take them to a level where people get them. And I think it's great for kids. I think it's wonderful. I mean, you said earlier you don't have children, but you were drawn to children's literature. I'm just curious, what drew you there? It's be, it was always writing for kids, for me. Um, and it's because of being such a big reader when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah. Now, how many books have, do you have out already? This is my 23rd. Wow. Not counting the poetry book. This uh -huh. is my 23rd for kids. Wow. So when, um, when Ogre Enchanted comes out, I will be a quarter of a century into books, 25 books. <laughs> That's a lot. And yeah. you started when you were how old when you were starting when you were writing? Young. I was, no, not young. I was first published when I was 49. Wow. Wow. That's so exciting. So when you get to 25, you should have a party or something. Or something. Or yes, something, because that's a milestone. The there you go, at the studio around the corner. It's a milestone. Well, hopefully we'll get to it when your new book comes out. We'll do another repeat visit to the sure. studio around the corner. Sure, sure. Since the community is that. a buzz with you coming, I'm so excited about that. Um, well, again, we, um, we will have Gail reading for us and talking about her book and talking to children at the studio around the corner on May 28th. Um, it starts at 2 o'clock. You do need to make reservations, but they are free. But you can go online to www.oththeater.org. There is a reservation sheet to fill out just so we know that we have enough books and things for the people that attend. And we look forward to seeing you again. And thank you so much for joining us today. This thank was you, wonderful. Judy. Yes, thank it you. was terrific. Perfect.